Hello, everybody, and welcome back into another Hockey Writers Podcast season preview show here on the YouTube channel. And of course, wherever you're listening on your podcast uh, network, if you're just listening, um, we're getting, as you can see behind on beside me here, we're going to Toronto Maple Leafs. I've got uh, two writers that you know, Peter Barracchini, he's on almost, he's on so many shows, uh, <laughs> Maple Leafs Lounge, uh, Prospect Corner. I, yeah, he's had time on the podcast as well. Also, uh, welcoming back to the YouTube channel, Kevin Armstrong, who used to host the Maple Leafs Lounge, has been off for a bit, but thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Peter, for coming on. Uh, first of all, Kevin, how's it going? Uh, you know, off off air, I mean, <laughs> for most of the time, but we still see you writing quite a bit for the Hockey Raiders. So how's it going? Hey, hey, Matthew and Peter. It's great to see you guys and uh and nice to be back on the show. Life got in the way a little bit there, but uh, the lounge is still looking good. Happy that uh, Peter's still going with it strong. Um, <laughs> and life's been good, um, but from the hockey standpoint, I think you guys know from my articles, I'm, I'm not happy with this offseason. Mm-hmm. I don't like how it's gone at all. I, um, I've been, I, it's been crazy. You guys know we always get lots of different comments, everything mm-hmm. like that. But until I started getting a little bit more negative in my writing, I couldn't believe how much the, the positive you must support the team people hounded me. I was getting messages on my Facebook, personal Facebook, DMs on my Twitter with like, ah, you're not a fan, get out of here, blah, 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 <laughs> all this stuff. And I got to say, man, it's if you uh, are born into this team and you've been watching it for as long as I have, if some things happen in the offseason that you don't like, you can say those things. Mm. If I just started watching this team yesterday and started bashing it today, no, that's not cool. You can't do that. But, uh, you know, look behind me. Leafs through and through. I love this team. I want them to uh, succeed, but I'm not happy with how things have gone uh, the last couple of months. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot has happened. Not really. Maybe not a lot has happened with the Maple Leafs. Uh, you know, they let a few guys go in free agency. They added a few depth guys we'll talk about. Um, some contracts haven't been signed, which, of course, you probably know who I'm talking about there. Um, you know, Peter, how's it going? I mean, uh, Maple Police Lounge, like I say, we've gone through that. Uh, mm-hmm. And of course, you're writing as well. So how's it going uh, today? Yeah, doing great. Actually, Kevin, glad you're back because it feels like a blast from the past, from the old days when you were hosting. So, And also, I learned all the best uh, from the best. So glad that the lounge is still going. I'm blushing. And glad that you're back <laughs> here talking Maple Leafs with us. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, so I was actually, I was really happy, Kevin, that uh, you had interest to do this season preview show. Uh, so like I say, it's great to talk to you again. So let's get started with the show and uh, start talking about the new additions. I mean, like I said, there's no big names here. I mean, it's more depth guys, but uh, some guys, you know, usually depth sometimes wins you championships. So, I mean, some of these guys could make a big difference in the playoffs when we do get there. So um, start. I'll start with you, Peter, on this guy, Callie Yankrock. Uh, came over from the Calgary Flames free agent. Um, didn't do much for the Flames, but uh, was with Seattle Kraken as well last season. What do you think uh, Yarn Kruk will bring to the Maple Leafs uh, in 2022-23? I'm so glad you gave me Kelly Yarn Kruk because you know how much I love him. Um, you know, with the absence of Ilya Mikheyev and, you know, some other death pieces, you need to try and fill that out. And Yarn Kroc brings just that. I know there was a lot of heat and questions about, you know, giving 2.1 million to a 30 year old that hasn't even cracked, you know, 35 plus or 40 points. Cause he did crack 35 in 17, 18, but that's not Cali Yarn Kroc. He's not, he's there to provide some good steady secondary scoring and he's going to do just that with the Maple Leafs. He's got the speed. He can play multiple positions. I believe he could play all three. So he's got that versatility. He can move up and down the lineup just as you need to. If there is an injury in the top six, you can try and move him up. Uh, maybe he, I, I believe he's getting some looks on the top line in preseason. Obviously, you're not going to look at him right away, but maybe to see what he can do if they can try and fit him into a top six role, but most likely you see him as kind of that third liner energy kind of winger because of his speed, his ability to get on the four check. And that was something that was lacking in the bottom six last season. And I think injecting him into the lineup is going to go well for them. Um, You know, you look at his numbers, it's been very consistent. He's been a very consistent 30 point score since his time with Nashville, obviously, 
up and down seasons. Uh, he did have some good analytics overall with Calgary, but not so much with Seattle because Seattle's a rebuilding team. We know how they were going into the season, but now that he's on a, um, I, I would hope a contending team right now with an improved, you know, more youthful, not youthful, but energetic uh, bottom six. I think he's going to do a lot of great things. And I think that it was a very underrated signing. And I think a lot of fans are going to grow to like Callie Yarncrog based on what he can do and with the energy that he brings. Yeah. I mean, I, I liked the signing when it happened. I mean, Yarncrog's a very good depth guy and he did when he was in Nashville, he did score. Um, mm -hmm. He was able to score some goals too. So I, he can bring a lot to a lineup and uh, I think it was a good, a good signing. We'll see how it kind of goes, um, you know, throughout the season, but uh, you know, I'm excited to see what he can do. All right, Kevin, over to you. We'll talk about another depth guy, uh, Nicholas Ar Albi Kubel, who, um, you know, he's had stints of, you know, Colorado Avalanche. He won a cup there this past time. I was in the Philadelphia Flyers organization for a bit as well. Um, what do you think he will bring uh, to the Maple Leafs this season? This one's uh, short and sweet. He's going to hit everybody. Yeah. Uh, I love <laughs> yep. this. Uh, I love this one. I think it's an uh, underrated signing. Um, I know I said I, I didn't like a lot of things that happened in the offseason, but I did like that one because we've seen it over and over and over again. Um, the hits just aren't there when they need to be there. The grit's not there. And this guy, hey, man, he put a dent in the Stanley Cup. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's tough. He, uh, he's going to bring what uh, what Leaf fans want to see. I think he might even get some some moves around because yeah. he's he's been okay in some other positions throughout. And here's the big thing with him. He was a Philadelphia Flyers draft pick in uh, 2014. Played with that organization all the way through until he was put on waivers seven yeah. games into last season and then picked up by Colorado. Not sure exactly where Colorado was, but I'm sure they were near the top at the time. So that means yeah. all the other teams had mm -hmm. to look at him for nothing. And what did he do? He turned into a, a pretty good fourth liner, third liner, grit player, wins a Stanley Cup. His confidence probably got a little bit shattered there. I'm thinking when the Flyers sent him on waivers. Yeah. But he got it all back plus some. He just got a tattoo of the uh, Stanley Cup with a dent on it. I think uh, he's going to be a great, um, you know, bottom six player that I think is going to hit everybody. Yeah, he he's a very, again, another player I really like. Uh, and like you say, he he did really well in the playoffs. Uh, you know, very <laughs> you know, he's going to always be in the history books for denting the Stanley Cup in that video. But. <laughs> You know, it's all fun, and uh, I'm sure he's laughing about it, uh, you know, right now. So, um, but yeah, in, in Toronto now is hopefully um, be help to win a cup there. I mean, that's uh, that's the hope. He's not going to be the reason, but he will help for sure. All right, Peter, back to you. And talking about a guy that I know very well, Adam Gaudet uh, in Vancouver, um, didn't work out here. Uh, one of the one of the more highly rated prospects. I know I wrote, I don't know how much I wrote about him when he was, uh, when he was here in Northeastern as well. I uh, followed his, his prospect development quite a bit, um, but he's now bounced around a few places. He was in Chicago. I, you know, he was traded to Chicago first and uh, then went to Ottawa off waivers. Um, you know, he hasn't really caught on since coming from Vancouver. So now he's in Toronto. Um, I read on Twitter that he's, been practicing on the top line with Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews. I mean, if he can spit there, it'd be pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about Gaudet and uh, what he can bring to Toronto? Yeah, I believe he was on the second or the top line for the second group, which was with Tavares and Marner. Again, Tavares, obviously, right. um, you know, line combos are not, mean nothing in preseason. We know that Bunting, Matthews, Marner are going to be together, but I digress. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know him very well, especially after he won the Hobie Baker and then, you know, 33 points in 59 games in 2019-20. It seemed like, you know, the ceiling or the sky was high for Adam Gaudet. Uh, but then I believe he overcame or dealt with, you know, an infection or a stomach virus had a lot of issues with that, but now I think he's on the men's and he's doing great. And the fact that, you know, he bounced back and scored six goals in 10 games at the, for team USA at the world hockey championship, think maybe the Maple Leafs saw something there that maybe he's starting to come around and he's starting to get back to the form that made him successful in college and in the early onset of his career. He's got a heavy shot. He's great. He's great in the corners and along the boards and battles. And 
you know, he's again, kind of like Jaron Krog. He's a very versatile player. He could play center, could play the wing. You could fit him in any sort of position, move him up and down the lineup. And obviously he probably projects as maybe the start on the fourth line, but if he's able to play extremely well and impress at camp, with his offensive capabilities, if he's able to bounce back and play with some, you know, great players on the top in a top six role, that top that second line left wing spot is up for grabs. I know he's a right wing, but maybe you try and utilize him in that position, have him on his off wing, see what he can do. Maybe you know he impresses and he does a great job and he fills that spot. Obviously, too early to tell based on his history, he's still trying to get back. But I, I think this was a very underrated signing, and I think th- this is one player that you should be looking out for because. He can do some damage with his with with the shot, as I mentioned. He's he's got that aggre- not aggressive mindset, but he's got that work ethic, that energy, that you know the Maple Leafs pride on. And I think with him in the fold in that bottom six role, I think he's going to do extremely well. And if he does move up, so be it, because he this is going to be a feel good story on how he's able to turn things around and come back stronger and better than ever. His sell celly game is on point too. So hey, there you go. <laughs> One thing I love about him, he's so enthusiastic when he scores. That was my my favorite thing about him. So I yeah, hey, I I actually really liked him in Vancouver. I, you know, I think there's just some circumstances around him that uh, you know, with the COVID uh, that COVID That's year it, yeah. really messed him up. He had mm-hmm. he got COVID. I uh, really d- had to deal with that and some stuff in the locker room. So I mean, a lot of stuff was just in Vancouver. It was kind of like he needed to you know, have new surroundings. So mm-hmm. I'm hoping he does do well in Toronto because really good, you know, seems like a really good guy. And, uh, and that's, you know, he has, he has some good qualities. He, like you say, his shots really good um, and he competes. So uh, I think he'll, he'll do really well. I don't think he's going to do very well if he has to take face-offs because he's not that good on face-offs, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right, Kevin, we'll talk about a little more under, maybe not, as well-known guy, but in Toronto, he is, uh, he's returning uh, to, to the Maple Leafs, Dennis Malgan. Uh, what do you think he will do in his return uh, to the team? Oh boy. Here comes the dark cloud boys. That's what I was talking about at the beginning. I can't stand this guy and it's nothing really even to do with him as much as it's to do with Kyle Dubas and trading Mason Marchment for this guy. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, when, when Dubas addressed the crowd on day one media day there and uh, said, I want my whole body of work to be judged. He should have kept Malgan in wherever he was, the Swiss league and <laughs> hope people forget about that. You traded away Mason Marchman, which made no sense at the time. Then the guy turns into an amazing player of Florida. Now he's getting 4.5 million for Dallas. Uh, he's a great player. He's the son of, Brian Marchment, who uh, unfortunately he passed away this summer, but uh, he, I love mm-hmm. that guy when he played a year with the Leafs, he had like 130 penalty minutes. And that was the last time the Leafs went to the second round of the Stanley cup playoffs. Let me tell you. So <laughs> I was really happy with Mason Marchman being on this team. And then when he got traded, I, I didn't care who it was traded for really. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to go well. So Dennis Malgan has done nothing for me. Swiss league leave him over there. He's, he's not going to make this lineup. Uh, he'll, he'll be forgotten about. Yeah. I had to throw him in there because I uh, needed, I needed four people and I was like, Oh, Hey, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> now you got me all fired up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it may too. Cause I know I remember, I remember talking about this guy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, <laughs> all right, well, let's get on to some, uh, you know, pressing issues now, Peter, I talk about, that like you already talked about that kind of big hole on the second second line who do you see as the guy that's going to step up i know we mentioned a few guys on uh, maple Leafs lounge in the past mm-hmm. but who do you see as having the best chance of consistently this that's the key word here consistently mm-hmm. being in the top six alongside Tavares and Nylander consistently the hope is <laughs> you would like to see Nick Robertson there I mean, this is his opportunity with his development. I mean, two years removed from his last OHL game. You're looking really good in the AHL. Obviously, you need to round out some aspects defensively and maybe, as Haley Wickenheiser said, dial it back a bit because there's times where he does try to do too much with the puck, without the puck, maybe gets over excited when getting in on the four check sometimes and gets out of position. But I started to see a little bit of, of a progression throughout the rookie tournament, still some holes, but really thought that maybe he, this is maybe his time to run with it. 
because the opportunity is there and this is his chance. And, you know, the Maple Leafs are going to give him every single chance and opportunity to succeed. So I would hope that they would try and give him as much time in that top six rope to see how he would fare this time around, whether probably most likely going to be Tavares and Nylander again. But then again, if he doesn't, then there's going to be a revolving door of wingers. Pierre Engvall, even though he's injured, when he comes back, maybe he has a shot because he has a lot to prove because he he busted out offensively last season as well. Um, is Cali Yarncroft maybe going to be there? Adam Gaudet, you know, we, we, we really don't know. Alexander Kerfoot, again, another name. So you have like maybe five or six solid options, but the hope is Nick Robertson can consistently take that spot, run away with it, given his ceiling his projection and his shot too i mean he just shoots everything in sight and he's yeah. got great accuracy so if he's able to find that consistency i it, it's his spot to take i think yeah, the key word that matthew said there too and uh, peter you hit on it is the consistency yes because yeah. all those forwards that you mentioned will probably play on the second line at some point in game one or two yeah, Keith yeah. <laughs> loves changing his lines and mm-hmm. he changes everybody out. But my my uh, consistency one would be a safe one with Kerfoot. That's who I think will be. There. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Well, big audition. Whoever gets there, that's two guys mm-hmm. you can play with uh, <laughs> and get you some points. So uh, it'd be good to stay there. Well, let's ha- talk about a guy, Kevin, that has no problem getting points and no problem getting goals. <laughs> Uh, Austin Matthews, he hit 60 goals last season, broke franchise record. I mean, yeah, a heart trophy winner as well. I mean, he's just insane. Do you think he will do that again or just go back to his average of 30 to 40 goals, which is not horrible? Um, what do you think will happen with Matthews this year? See, so when you're saying average of 30 to 40, those came during those COVID shortened seasons. True. So I think yeah. when you look at his stats lines, it kind of, if you're not looking over at the games played to the goals and the, the points, it kind of looks skewed, right? Um, but so if you take our last season as, as our, our judging point, he was injured at the beginning of that season. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was suspended in that season. I love that <laughs> suspension still. But um, he, he only got 73 games and 60 mm-hmm. goals. So, and he was healing his wrist. I don't know if they put like a Terminator type uh, attachment in that (laughs) wrist when he had the surgery or what, but uh, he's only getting better. All of the, uh, all the signs show that it's just forward progression is just going up and up and up and up. And I don't think we've seen the best of Austin Matthews as great as he was last year. I think we're going to see better. And I think that's scary. I think he'll, well, I'll save my bold predictions for later on, but uh, I think it's going to be the year of Austin Matthews for sure. And one other yeah, thing, to wasn't note too, <laughs> one other thing to note too with Austin Matthews when he came in or when he started playing again, he was about you know 10, 10 or so goals behind the next leader, and throughout the season he kept scoring and scoring, and as everyone started to slow down, he kept going. And we're going to see, like you said, Kevin, we're going to see another gear with him. And I think maybe we're going to probably see 65 at, at maybe for the upcoming season, because it is possible. Mm. I, I totally agree. I think 65 is there, if not higher. And you know, it's crazy when you're talking about how he got better as the season progressed. Mm-hmm. That's when teams knew, okay, you got to do something to screw this guy up. You know, <laughs> like you got to start clutch and hold, man, like uh, slow him down. And it, it, it nothing worked. He just kept yeah. it. Hey, he's just so good. And the thing is, is like just right from his first game, we scored the four goals and it was it four goals in his first game. Yep. Yeah. You knew that he was going to be a, a star in this league and definitely has become that. You know, I love the four goals story because he signed a stick to Craig Anderson, who he scored the four goals on with Ottawa. Yeah. And he said, <laughs> said, thanks for F O U R the memories. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Austin looks like he, he's, he's uh, quite the character off the ice too. I think we've learned as well. Yeah, that's for sure. All right. Well, let's talk about his line mate now, Peter and Mitch Marner. He had a career season too, 97 points best since his 94 point season, 2018, 19. What do you expect from him this season? Do you see a hundred points in the future? I mean, he would have hit a hundred points last season. I yeah. mean, three off, especially down the stretch when he got hot, um, you know, averaging, you know, what, what was it? I think almost close to two points per game from January on. That was just impressive production from Mitch Meyer. And if he had a much better 
consistent October and even early part of November, you would have saw him hit that, you know, 105, 100, mm-hmm. closing in on 110 point mark. And even if Austin Matthews is there, obviously his production would have been up as well. But that October and November stretch when the team was struggling and everyone was complaining about Mitch Marner saying that, hey, you know, Austin Matthews is gone close to 11 million. He's not showing up. The criticism was, you know, it was kind of fair because you expect your star players or other star players to step up and, you know, your franchise players absence. And Mitch Marner didn't really quite have that ever since he came off that COVID list though, in January, I mean, I, I don't know what happened. He, it was just like another, he, yeah, kind of like Matthews. He found another gear. He found the energy, he found the momentum and he kept rolling with it from the end of the season into the playoffs I think we're going to I, kind of like Matthews. I think we're going to see another gear in Mitch Marner. I think he's going to be extra motivated this time around. I know that he would like to prove, or he proved a lot of doubters that time in the second half that saying that, Hey, you know, maybe he did have some early season struggles. He forgot about that, moved on. And now it, the same thing may happen ca- or carry over into the season. So I think this is the season where Mitch Marner actually hits a hundred points, not projection, not based on an 82 adjusted schedule, because as much as that was nice to see, it dis- it still didn't happen. I think this is the season that Mitch Marner is going to hit a hundred points and we're going to see it consistently night in night out. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't add this in before we move on. I I didn't I'm, I didn't put this in about asking about Michael Bunting. Uh, no. <laughs> so I'll ask you, you got, quickly. Both you got robbed of rookie of the year. Do you see Kevin? Do you see Michael Bunting? Uh, you know, progressing even higher than what he did last season. Uh, yeah, that's tough because that I, that was amazing. Really, no yeah. one really expected that kind of season out of this guy. Um, you, you hoped for it, but. Um, here's the thing at the end of the season, he got, uh, injured and had a few games off. And when he came back for playoffs, he wasn't himself. Um, that, you know, that kind of showed what that kind of player, the physical tone that that takes on their body to play 82 mm-hmm. games like that. And that caught up to him. And I'm a little bit concerned that that might roll over. I think he's a regression candidate just because of that physical style of play that he plays night in and night out. All it takes is one little fall the wrong way. And, you know, he, he was, you know, he wasn't there for the playoffs last year, unfortunately, um, in the way that he had been in midseason form. So uh, it'd be nice. It would certainly be nice if he was there uh, the way he was last season. But um, hopefully he's been in the gym and uh, getting stronger because everyone's going to be coming after him in the blue paint this year. That's true. Um, what do you think, Peter? Do you think, uh, we're seeing Bunting uh, take another step or is he just going to stay the same or regress? Um, I, th- I think maybe a slight regression. I think he's still going to be in that 50, 60 point range. I don't, he may hit that point because then again, you look who he's playing with Matthews and Marner, right? And most of his production <laughs> came at even strength, only five power play points, 58 even strength points. So most of his damage is done at five on five, just like Matthews and Marner. Power play struggled at times last year. So I think at five on five, if they're able to maintain their dominance, Michael Bunting's still going to rack up the points no matter what. Yeah, we're playing with those two. I, I think <laughs> get, go to the net, you'll probably get some, some some goals and points. Yeah, and Bunting's power play, he was on second unit power play too. And yeah. that one, um, you know, it didn't really compare to that first line power yeah. play. But uh, yeah, I think more the scoring is great and the points are great for Bunting, but we know he's there as kind of a positional player to, yeah. to muck it up, you know, and to draw the penalties and and things like that. I'm just hoping physically he's yeah. able to uh, mm-hmm. sustain that throughout the whole season and hopefully a playoff run. Yeah, that's true. Yep. All right, let's circle back to the bottom six now and talk about another guy that's not under contract right now, but is trying to get one. Uh, Kevin's a very late signing PTO Zach Aston Reese um do you think he makes the team and if he does what type of impact will he have yes I totally think he makes this team I was I was really surprised that he just fell into the lap of Toronto I I thought what is this the same guy I'm thinking of is this somebody I haven't heard of like this is yeah, it is him. Um, and <laughs> I don't know why no one else has signed him. I think yeah. he's going to, I think he's a steal really for Dubas. And we've seen this before. Um, and as, as upset as I get with Dubas every once in a while, this <laughs> one goes down as another really good bargain find. Yeah. I don't know why, why it was even there, but everyone finds 
gold in the bottom of the bargain basement sometime, I guess. <laughs> he's another great grinder. I think he'd be a great fourth line guy. Um, and he's also got a lot of experience um, with winning teams. Yeah. Uh, I think I think it was a great find, and I think he will make this team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so too. And I am I'm surprised too that why he wasn't signed before. I mean, a lot of guys actually. Sonny Milano has a PTO and he had like a ridiculous season mm-hmm. last year. I know there's pro, you know, talk about his concussions and maybe that's an issue. Um, but you know, he's still a skilled player that's gone under, you know, why is waiting for a PTO? But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, I think he does make the team too. All right, Peter, let's talk about the bottom six as a whole now this season. I what do you think of it? I mean, last season, there was a lot of veterans, you know, Jason Spezza. Um, we had previous year was Joe Thornton. Um, you know, how do you rank this version of the, or potential projected version of the bottom six to uh, previous years? Even though you may not get a whole lot of offense from this, you know, maybe third line or fourth line, especially the fourth line, this bottom six is more quick more agile and more aggressive than it was the previous season. Um, Obviously you look at Wayne Simmons, you look at Kyle Clifford physical in their own right, but they were very, very slow and they got hemmed in their zone quite a bit. And if you need any more evidence to playoffs, they got hemmed in quite a bit, especially against Tampa's fourth line. You need, um, you, you need the energy, you need the speed, you need the grid for a fourth line. Tampa had that Toronto had nothing going for them aside from Jason Spezza every now and then. Um, I think now with the addition of Abe Kubel and Reese, they add that physical element. They add the speed, they add, you know, uh, special aspects to, uh, special teams, especially on the penalty kill with Zach ass and Reese, um, Godet with his shot. I mean, he could probably chip in maybe 10, 15 points. Same with Abe Kubel, that secondary scoring is going to be key. And if they're able to get in, uh, kind of like, um, what Kevin said about Michael Bunting, muck it up with the opposition, get in their face, be aggressive, establish zone time. I think it's going to, they're going to be very effective. And even in 2020, 21 in that bubble, I did not think that fourth line, that fourth line was going to come back and, you know, be a real, you know, thorn in their side or real Mm -hmm. bad aspect to their game. And it was because it did catch up to them. The fourth, you look at other teams, fourth line, they're quick. They're in your face. Toronto's was in your face, but they were not quick. And having that right right now, that good balance in the third and fourth line, I think it's going to be really great for them. Yeah, a lot of good good uh, bottom six signings. I think they added this year. So, uh, and that's what you need in the playoffs. Uh, the playoffs, and that's where these guys shine. So, probably won't see the impact of it until they do make the playoff. You know, until the playoffs come around. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, and that's going to be for the whole team. We all know that. <laughs> the way that Keith runs his team too as he said this is he the first and second line there's a lot of talent there a lot mm-hmm. of skill he kind of lets them do their thing the third and fourth line they better be positionally sound and they better follow yeah. his systems to a t and i think they've got a lot of great great potential there for players mm-hmm. that are um you know maybe have had their confidence broke maybe we're looked past by all these other teams and they are gonna stick to sheldon Keefe's system and play that bottom six role um, like their life depends on it. Because for a lot of these guys, they're one, one year contracts. This is your opportunity to show that you belong in the league. Yeah, that's very true. All right. Well, let's talk about this forward group as a whole and uh, talk about the division, which has gotten better. Uh, you know, the Atlantic division is, you know, Ottawa senators have loaded up. Uh, they're going to be tougher to beat. Uh, you know, some of the other teams have, have improved too. So, Kevin, what do you think this core group kind of matches up in the division right now? I think they're the they're at the top with a lot of the other at the top guys in this division. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a very good division and a lot of fun to watch. Um, the most frustrating part of the Maple Leafs from last year was they would play those Tampa's and Florida's and Boston so well, and then they would do nothing when Ottawa comes to town and Montreal, and then you know. Um, so, uh, but forward wise, I think they're at the top, maybe uh, tied with uh, with some of those Sunshine State teams uh, for the forward group, um, and would be there right with the you know the other cream of the crop in the NHL for sure. Yeah, I have to agree with that yeah. too. I mean, Ottawa is an unknown; they do have some higher level guys now up at the top there, but uh, we don't know how they're going to kind of fit in. So, uh, 
we'll have to see, but it's going to be really exciting to watch this division uh, kind of duke it out uh, for the playoffs. All right, well, let's shift to the defense. Uh, you know, it's a lot of question marks because of injury and stuff, but uh, let's talk about the new additions who are probably going to factor in a little more than we kind of expected uh, to start. So, Peter, we'll start with you and talk about Jordy Ben. Uh, again, I don't know how many former Canucks in you have. Uh, <laughs> Jordy Ben also played for the Canucks uh, a couple seasons ago, was a pretty good depth guy, He'd played top four at times. But um, what do you think he will bring uh, to the Maple Leafs? Um, a player who will kind of like Abe Kubil hit everything in sight and maintain that defensive presence on the back end. Obviously, you have um Morgan Riley up front, Mark Giordano on the back end as well, who can transition up and join the offense every now and then, albeit having a more two-way style play. But it shores up their defensive depth in the in the event that they do get injuries, and we're seeing that right now um with Timothy Lilligren. So you have someone like Jordy Ben that could come in, maybe not have the upside, but he has the smarts and he has the defensive capabilities to shut things down in his own end. And, you know, need be, if he needs to move up into the lineup, same thing applies. And, you know, I, the biggest thing is with him, and I, I know we're going to get to the other signing soon, he can play both the left hand, right hand side. That was a major issue with the Maple Leafs where they had all these left-handed defensemen who can't play the right side. Now they have a left-handed shot who can play the right side, similar to that of TJ Brody. Having that kind of aspect or a kind of, again, kind of durability or versatility to their game is going to work out well because if TJ Brody can be a left-hand shot and play on the right side, there's bound to be other defensemen that can. And bringing in a steady defensive presence like Jordy Ben, where the Maple Leafs have offense with, Riley Brody and Muzzin and Lilligren, but he's injured. It, it, it gives him that balance on the back end. And I think Jordy Ben was a really great underrated signing. Yeah. I liked Ben in Vancouver. Uh, I think he, he played really maybe a bit up the lineup than he probably should have, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, I thought he was really good uh, for any partners he was with. I think he played with Quinn Hughes um, a couple times, a few times too. And I looked pretty good beside him. So um, we'll see what happens with him. Like I said, the injuries, he may have to play a bit more uh, than, than probably is expected at the beginning. All right, Kevin, let's talk, let's talk about another guy that uh, got, you know, bounced around a bit, Victor Mete, uh, you know, pretty big guy in Montreal for a bit. Uh, but like I say, he's bounced around a bit. Um, what do you think about the signing of Mete? Terrible. <laughs> I'm done. Next. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Um, I, I don't understand um, this one because we got to see this guy a few times uh, when he was with Ottawa and um, he, he was more offensive, uh, but he is the left, left side, left shot. So I guess that's a premium. Um, and I guess that's the, the thing he's got going for him because he certainly doesn't have size. He's five, nine. I, it's listed at 185. I'm, I'm questioning 185. <laughs> I don't know how he's going to deal with uh, some of these top players in the league. Um, but like we've said, there's um, three of the top seven Leaf defensemen from last year um, that are question marks right now. So he's got an opportunity. Does he stick? I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't like it. He's too small. Like, come on. I want a Victor Hedman, not a <laughs> Victor Mente. <laughs> that thing, I don't want that. It, it's a miss. It's a, a typo. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see on that one. He's got an opportunity. The runway is clear, but um, the size is just yeah. for a defenseman. I don't get it. Yeah. That's probably why he's bounced around a bit. Uh, he hasn't been able to stick on a lot of teams probably because of that fact. So uh, we'll have to see. And like I say, another more big opportunity for uh, because of injuries and stuff, which we'll talk about right now. Um, Peter, I mean, he had some bad news, uh, injury wise in the first media availability there, him is a little grown out six weeks. Um, Jake Muzzin, a little bit more optimistic on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the talk that, you know, he may be ready. They were just kind of holding him out because of precautionary reasons back discomfort. But I always say the back is always an issue. It always seems to flare up, uh, throughout the season. And, um, that's not a good sign to start. So who will have to step up? If all three, if, I am say all three, but we'll talk with the third guy later. I, with these guys out of the line. Yeah, I've had, I've been dealing with back issues since 23 and I can say it's not fun. I had to put my, end my hockey career, even just for like 
just for fun because of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really upset to hear about Timothy Lilligren. Jake Muzzin is a little bit more optimistic, like you said, because, you know, it was just more of a precautionary thing. Hold them out because get them back in when they start dealing with more training as opposed to like the, the skating and all that. But um, yeah, I, I, I think you got to look at Justin Hall. I mean, this is a guy who might be on the ropes with his, with his job on the line. We saw how well Timothy Lilligren progressed last season. We saw how much a need they are more of a consistent two-way defenseman on the right-hand side. We saw times that Justin Hall just makes really egregious errors that just leaves you scratching your head at some time at certain points. And, you know, he's been, a, he's been a mainstay in the top four. And if he needs to, if this is the perfect opportunity for him to shine, obviously Lilligren's still going to be in the third, third pairing with Giordano. If Hall he comes out of the gate swinging with the very more consistent effort in that second pairing role, then he's going to solidify his job a little bit more and not have to worry about, you know, a young player trying to take his job away from him because throughout the whole entire year I've been campaigning about having Timothy Lilligren in that top four and now with him injured obviously you don't want to see that but this is you know a situation for Hall where he's able to maintain his spot for the time being see what he can do at the beginning of camp and at the beginning of the season and then if you know Lilligren comes back and Hall struggles and Lilligren plays well in his return and he gets more of an opportunity and more looks in the second pairing, then it's, you know, going to be tough for Justin Hall to try and crack back or get back into that spot because he was made a healthy scratch quite a bit last season. Yeah. Well, I mean, Giordano is going to be putting a lot more pressure on him to play at such a, an old age. Yeah. He's, I mean, it looks like he's fine, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to have to play a lot, I think, to start the season if all these guys are out. So, um, I'm looking at Giordano being a big part uh, of this uh, to kind of keep the head above water till that happens. Everyone kind of coming back. I think the Jake Muzzin thing is a bigger concern, really, mm. um, yeah. because he only played, um, I just called it up here, 47 games last year. You know, so this has been coming for a while. And um, uh, mm. come on, you're back, NHL yeah. defenseman. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to be relied on against the best of the best. And um, yeah. Yeah. my Woodstock boy, my hometown. <laughs> but, man, Jake, I don't know. I'm hoping for you, but it's not looking good. Yeah, like I say, the back is like the groin for goaltenders. I mean, it, well, the back's bad for goaltenders, too. I mean, <laughs> yeah. bad back, too. But um, it's like that. You know, it just keeps flaring up. I, if you have problems, it just seems to, seems to always be a problem. So, um, hopefully it's not as, as bad, but, um, it could be a lingering issue. All right, Kevin, let's talk about the big news has been kind of floating around all off season. Uh, Rasmus Sandin still not signed, not in training camp, probably not going to start the season unless something happens. When do you see a contract happening or is this just, uh, he's going to be traded at some point? Uh, uh, I'm thinking it's got to happen now. Like how much more bad news can you have that you kind (laughs) of need to solidify your back end? Um, Unfortunately, we kind of saw this one coming because uh, this is Willie Nylander's best buddy and they share the same agent. I don't know why Dubas, when he talked right after the draft and he kind of talked about Sandine as it kind of seemed almost like a done deal. Like, Oh, this is easy stuff. You know, nothing to worry about, nothing to see here. And it was like, you do know who you're talking to, right? It's like, I didn't, obviously he wants more money than they gave Lilligren. Um, and that was a two-year deal worth what? Uh, I think he's at 1.2 for the, for those years, something like that. Obviously he wants more money. Leaves are already over the cap. Um, it's not looking good. So at this point um, they can't start the season down w- what a Sandine would bring. So maybe a trade and just bring in a defenseman that uh, is actually under contract that can play right now. And the new team can worry about Sandine's deal because I don't know how they can get it done. If they don't get it done in the next couple of days here, they've got to trade and get somebody in. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's taken way Mm -hmm. too long and uh, you know, how long did Nylander wait? And it was like into the season, like two, two months in. It was, it was, it was at, it was at the, the last deadline. hour. 
Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was nuts. And then he pretty much lost that season. He, he never really achieved where he was supposed to be because you can't play pick up halfway through the season like that. And we yeah. can't go through another. Um, I don't think players, they've kind of learned from that Nylander situation. It's not, mm -hmm. it's detrimental to the player to hold out too. You, you yeah. lose a lot of time. Yeah. I wonder if we see kind of similar, like a Nils Lungfis situation. Obviously he was under contract, different situation with his play time, but maybe the Maple Leafs do trade and get a really good first round pick, especially if it's this year in 2023, this is a deep draft. And if the Maple Leafs can maximize that pick for Rasmus Sandin, who knows what can happen? I mean, again, it was like from one, con one contending team to a playoff team. So maybe, same thing can happen where the Maple Leafs are, are a team in the playoffs, need a left-hand defenseman, they could give them the contract. Maybe the Maple Leafs take advantage of that. Mm. Yeah, but that would also mean they are without him in any way if they're just getting a yeah. draft pick. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Uh, how worried are you? Um, without Lilligren, Sandin, possibly even Muzzin to start the season, how worried are you about this defense to start? Yeah, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't worried because there, there is some doubt underneath there because of the fact that you're out, you know, three top six defenders for your team right there. I mean, that, that that's a big hole to fill. Um, obviously, you have Riley and Brody as your top pairing. You're looking at Giordano and um, Hall as your second pairing. And then you're going to probably look at Mete and uh, Ben as your third pairing. So you have, you have depth there, but how well are they going to play is what we want to see. Obviously you don't want to draw too many conclusions right now because you want to see games played, see how well they do. But if they, if they play relatively well and hold the line and, and they're stable, I think they can manage without that. But to me, the big question is going to be Lilligren because I think he's bound for a really great season and a very strong breakout season at that. Um, Sandin again, left-hand shot. You got players that can play both left and right. And Muzzin, again, when healthy, he's absolutely fantastic. But when he's injured, again, that's when you start to worry about his age and his contract right now because how are you going to deal with that? So a little bit, of, a lot of, a, I'm going to say a little to a little, uh, I, don't, I don't even know how to say this. <laughs> I'm uncertain on how things are going to play out, but I'm not very panicky just yet. I want to see until we get to that 15 game mark where we see, okay, this is our defense is going to play. Then you need to make, need to make another move. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, the I'm thing the is, panic button. Uh, yeah, not I, I didn't like the defense <laughs> really. Uh, it's, it's needed some work for a while. Um, we know that the defensive core has paid the price of having a top end. Your, you know, your, your core four forwards paid as much. Mm -hmm. The defensive yeah. core doesn't have it. Um, now they've got Morgan Riley signed, but he's not Victor Hedman. Is he? Yeah. Did I mention yeah. I want Victor Hedman? Um, <laughs> and yeah. So to me, uh, there was a time when Dubas was running down all the uh, issues that were going on that I half expected him to say, and we've announced that Zdeno Shara is on the team and walked the big giant out because at this point, it's that much of a panic that uh, you need to find somebody that can skate around and maybe uh, take a few minutes off of the old mm -hmm. legs of Giordano yeah. and uh, Riley and Brody as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I had to see how it kind of all plays out, but uh, let's talk about it. You know, going to this season, Kevin, why do you think this defense kind of matches up in the division? I mean, I said one healthy in our outline here, but I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, how does it look right now? Because this is what they're going into the season with. Yeah, it's for sure trouble. And, you know, we'll get to it in the next uh, segment as well with goaltending being a big question mark. But, you know, the blue line's got to help the goaltenders out here. And yeah. once you get past the, the top line pairing that, uh, you know, is – probably Riley and Brody again. Um, and then Giordano is going to have a, a rotating partner as far as we know. I don't know. It's, it hasn't looked good. Um, and that's what I really hoped that Dubas would address in this off season was to get that blue line better. And um, I, I wish Giordano was, you know, the form of 10 years ago and that blue <laughs> line would be there, but that's not the case. Um, he's still very good. I wish, uh, I could skate like him at 39 years old, 38 years old, or 60 years old, or however old he is. But uh, <laughs> um, there, this is trouble. This is a lot of trouble right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's the big question mark uh, going in. So we'll, we'll just have to see. <laughs> 
All right. Well, you mentioned it, goaltending, and this is a position that changed completely uh, in the off season. Some some say for the worse. Uh, some say some kind of let's wait and see. But they brought in two guys. So let's start with the, with the main guy that uh, is has some history with Dubis and uh, stuff like that. So Peter, let's talk about Matt Murray. Um, what do you think about this? Not signing trade had mm-hmm. uh, to get him on the team. Yeah, big gamble and big risk for Dubis. I mean, obviously you saw Jack Campbell on his sub 800 save percentage down the stretch last season. It wasn't quite enough. I mean, obviously playoffs obviously didn't look great at times, but he still managed to hold his own and try and bat out duel Andre Vasilevsky. Again, still wasn't enough. But for that time when Jack Campbell had you know, the sub 800 say percentage in Jan- in February, in January, February, and March. Um, I believe Matt Murray had a sub 906 say percentage all last season. Again, small sample because he was in and out of the lineup. I believe he did deal with COVID, got sent down. And again, I'm going to get a lot of, you know, backlash because for that stat and comparing the two, but I don't care because <laughs> it is what it is. Um when you look at even strength save percentage, he had a 913 last season and 820 high danger save percentage. And Jack Campbell's was 790. Mm-hmm. And that you and if anyone knows that high danger area is going to be a nightmare for goaltender, you got to be on the ball to locate the puck and make that save. Jack Campbell didn't. Matt Murray at times did in front of a much lesser defense unit with the Ottawa Senators. So Obviously, you're expecting him to bounce back. You're expecting to have that, you know, high save percentage in the high danger area and overall down the stretch, even though it was sporadic at times. Your hope is that he could get back to that second half form, be a little bit more consistent, stay healthy and get those games. And having that familiarity with Dubas, Keith, new goalie coach in town and even uh, um, his uh, goal tending consultant is with the Maple Leafs as well that he's known for a long time. So I think he's bound to have a, I, I would hope that he has a bounce back season. I'm rooting for him because this is a guy that won two cups with the Pittsburgh Penguins. So if he's able to get back to that form, great. If not, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those Stanley cups seem like ages ago for that. They, they do, were right? ages yeah. ago. They yeah. were <laughs> ages ago. Everyone says always a cup winner. It was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I'm not sure about it. I, I was actually really surprised when they got him. Yeah. I, you know, for a team that what did Murray? He was on waivers last year, and uh, yeah, I yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not mm-hmm. sure about it. But uh, Kevin, let's talk about the supposed backup. I guess um, we'll talk about if that's me the case. But Ilya Samsonov coming over from the Washington Capitals. I okay over there. What do you think about him? being uh, added to this uh, goaltending tandem. Well, everyone was trying to figure out exactly why um, Washington didn't extend, but I'm pretty sure I figured it out because um, Alex Ovechkin's getting old. And every time a shot came in on this guy, he flapped around like a fish out of water and gave Alex a near heart attack. So they had (laughs) to get him off the ice um, to save uh, Ovechkin and keep him a few more years to go after that scoring title. But uh, yeah, it's going to be entertaining to watch. He uh, <laughs> he makes every save look very difficult. And um, uh, he's, I don't know, he doesn't even have like a real, even last season when he, he was given the starting role, he got 44 games under his belt. Um, you know, not that great. Uh, over three on the goals against average on a, a pretty good Washington team. Um, yeah, this is... Um, this kind of fell in their lap as maybe a saver for when Matt Murray, if Matt Murray doesn't work out, um, you've got this guy that might, but these are two massive gambles. Um, but Samsonov is going to make watching games entertaining because every shot is an adventure. <laughs> I would yeah, say that that's... he did look better in the playoffs. Yeah. But yeah. Again, a lot needs to happen. I know that they were talking about or how he wanted to work on his, you know, movement in the crease and not be as sporadic or jumpy, as you mentioned, Kevin. So I think if he's able to maintain that movement in the crease and not be and not overcommit at times, I think you got something to work with there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he is young, right? And the, yeah. so there is a lot of upside. And uh, like you said, they've got a whole new um, goaltending coaching staff in there. So this is his opportunity, really. Yeah. 
Well, we'll have to see. That's going to be a big one yeah. uh, to kind of watch for in the fr- in the first few weeks to see if they're a, a big uh, problem or not. Well, Peter, let's talk about both of them together. And do you see this being a 1A, 1B? Or will one of them kind of emerge as the, the actual starter, um, you know, throughout the season? Yeah, we talked about, about this on the 6 and the 6 podcast too. Um, who's going to be the starter? And I think you are going to see that 1A, 1B tandem. I think both goaltenders are going to push each other to their limit because, you know, they both got a lot to prove. Samsonov with that contract, he says that he wants to prove himself that he is going to be a number one goaltender. And Matt Murray, with everything that's happened in the past, obviously he wants to get back to that number one status. So that I love that kind of like friendly competition that they have going on. And you're not bringing in a goaltender that is number one that you want to try and replace. You got two guys battling get out and are bat- starting back at, at uh, you know, zero yeah. to work their way up. So I think... Matt Murray is going to start it, but in the end, it wouldn't surprise me if Ilya Samsonov does overtake him, whether it's the, whether it's because they feel comfortable with him, kind of like what they did with Jack Campbell over Frederick Anderson in the past. Um, it, it, it remains to be seen. Again, I, I'm rooting for both goaltenders to try and bounce back because, you know, they, they, they got something to prove. And obviously, I'm not going to jump the gun and say I do not want – you know, Matt Murray or Samsonov on this team, I'm going to let it play out. I'm going to see where they are at the 20 game mark, make the judgment, let them play it out, let them see what's going on because they deserve that opportunity. And I think everyone in the least nation should give them that chance as well. It's fair. I, you know, they do deserve that chance to sign to see what happens. And I mean, their history is not good, but uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what mm-hmm. happens. It's a new season, new, new team, new everything for these guys. So, uh, you know, hit the reset button and just hope for the best, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, that's this is a big question now is where does this goaltending rank, Kevin, in the Atlantic division? So now I'm just going to go right over everything Peter said, because <laughs> I, I say they're, they're near the bottom. Really? Yeah. You've got a, in the Atlantic, you've got the, some great goalie tandems, great goalies themselves and the tandems. Um, you know, obviously Vasilevsky just takes the cake there and, yeah. <laughs> and then the, it just goes down from there about Rovsky and Knight with Florida. Um, Boston's got two great with Swayman and Allmark, uh, like, well, I shouldn't say great, but pretty good. Um, yeah. the Red Wings even have got some goalies there now as well. Yeah. Ottawa went and got Cam Talbot, who I think is a pretty good, uh, goaltender. And that's the biggest red flag to me with, with uh matt murray is how desperate ottawa was to get rid of this guy they're still paying his contract 25 percent. they gave draft yeah. picks just take him please yeah. please <laughs> take him and uh that's my biggest red flag i don't think ottawa is um is stupid i think they they know something that they don't want this guy around anymore the injuries are too much and um so it, it puts them right near the bottom of the atlantic division so we go from the forwards being the top the defenseman being kind of mediocre to bottom to the the last and the goaltenders really. And that's what this team has been kind of about for the last four years. Mm. Yeah. And then only get worse if Jack Campbell uh, thrives in Edmonton. So <laughs> hey, you guys know, I live in the Edmonton area, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to watch the Edmonton Maple Leafs this year. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got Zach Hyman there too, right? So yeah, Tyson uh, Berry, Cody, and he is really good too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Maple Leafs 2.0. Yeah, <laughs> they all had pretty good seasons last year too. So they did. Well, Tyson Berry is kind of dropping off because of Evan Bouchard kind of emerging. Yeah, but, um, right. yeah, he's still useful. He's still a useful defenseman. So he may not even be in Edmonton very much longer. So we'll see. Okay, well, let's get to a fun part of the show, our quick fire round, which we're going to, I'm going to, we're, I, I'm going to fire questions at you guys. I, you know, it's going to be a quick one word, could be one word answer. It could be just a quick one or two sentences, kind of explain if you want to do that. But I'm just going to, you know, fire some quite fun questions at you. So, and we'll start with you, Peter, on this one. What is the biggest storyline? We probably have gone through this already. Biggest storyline or question mark going into the season? Can the Maple Leafs win a playoff round? Always that's a big it. question. <laughs> that's it. I, I, I think, I, I mean, that's the basic one. I think the next one would be, 
what moves does Dubas have up his sleeve during the season to try and still re retool this roster and try and make them a little bit more competitive. Like we talked about the defense, if he could go out and get another defender. Great. Uh, let's see what he can do this season because his contract is up. Yeah. Oh, that's a big one. All right, Kevin, what do you think? Biggest storyline or question mark? Yeah, the storyline is going to be the playoffs and Dubas even addressed it and, you know, wishes we could kind of fast forward through the regular season because I actually wrote in the summer an article that uh, this is the season about nothing to take the Seinfeld Mm -hmm. episode. You know, it's going to be great to watch hockey again, but this doesn't matter. The season doesn't matter. Austin Matthews, a great player. He doesn't really even care about the individual accolades that he gets during the regular season. He wants the cup. Yeah, it's it's all Stanley Cup or, or nothing at this point. It's very true. All right, uh, Kevin, we'll start with you on this one. Now pick one or two breakout stars for the season. Breakout stars this year. Um, it, this one's kind of weird, uh, but I'm going to go Willie Nylander hmm. because I think he is a star, but he plays on the second line of a star-studded team. And if you guys watched uh, him play in the, um, the Worlds after the playoffs ended there, Holy cow, throwing the body around. It was a different kind of Nylander. Uh, yeah. He was possessed out there, and his playoff performance has always been really well. Maybe he's developed into this guy that we really like and want to see. I think he's going to be a 40-goal scorer. I think he – I always think he's going to be traded to a team where he will be the top-line guy and will be the face of the franchise. And uh, so I'm going Willie. All right, good choice. All right, Peter, what do you think, uh, breakout star? Um. I was gonna I was gonna say Pierre Engvall for one because of the fact that he can that he does have a lot to prove. He may get that chance on the top six. Granted, he's gonna be at a little bit shorter amount of time than Timothy Lilligren, but also Ilya Samsonov. Um, see what he can yeah. do in goal. Uh, obviously, again, a lot to prove, similar to Engvall, and we already talked about him, so I'm not, I'm just gonna keep that short. All right. All right, Peter, we'll back to you on what who do you think needs to bounce back this season? Justin Hall. I, 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 mean, I think that's the more obvious choice because of the fact that how we saw glimpses of him in the bubble, how he was, you know, emerging as maybe a top four defender to a defender that was like trying to do too much and overcommit and make careless mistakes in his own end. I think he, if he needs someone needs to bounce back, it's going to be him. All right. Kevin, what do you think? Both goalies. Yeah. Period. The end. They have to bounce back. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have to. <laughs> uh-huh. Very true. All right, uh, Peter, pick one player. It could be an X factor this season. Uh, I'm going to say Michael Bunting. I, we, again, Kevin kind of talked about him, how he needs to be, you know, maintain that consistency and being that agitator that, you know, we've grown to love. And if he's able to replicate that 60 point season and still be in the face of the opponents, whole man, look out. Cause he's still going to be an important uh, part of this team. For sure. Uh, Kevin, what do you think? Obey Kubel. Um, I just love the grit and the the feistiness of this guy is showing. I think he really showed character by doing what he did in Colorado after being mm-hmm. put on waivers. And uh, I think he's going to step into a penalty kill role to take up the, the position left by Mikheyev. And I think he could really do a lot of good things for this team. Yeah, I definitely see that for sure. All right, Peter, uh, one rookie or prospect that could surprise and make the team out of training camp. Again, obvious choice would be Nick Robertson. Matthew Nyes ain't coming until the collegiate season's done. So I'm going to say Alex Steves. I was really impressed with him at the rookie tournament. This guy was doing it all. Is I He's got great speed and agility. I didn't think he could get any faster, and he did. Um, he was all over the ice, getting into the board battles, being aggressive, being... Um, you know, just a standout player every single time I was always drawn to him. And, you know, Keith wants those kind of players that can, you know, be gritty battle and maintain possession. Steve's just did just that. And I think he has a good chance to try and crack the team. Yeah. Good choice there. Uh, Kevin, what do you think rookie or prospect to make the team? Yeah, I was going to say Robertson as well, but it's so obvious. And this is kind of now or never for him, but mm-hmm. I don't have a name on this, but it's got to be somebody in the defensive core because mm-hmm. the, the yeah. you know, the runway's wide open. There's several positions open for somebody to grab. And uh, I don't know who it is just yet. I know I'm kind of fleecing on this one, but I think uh, there's going to be a rookie defenseman that's going to get the time and going to make the team as a surprise. 
yeah, well, like you say, there's a lot of uh, opportunity there for sure. All right, uh, back to you, Peter. Uh, what other players should fans be watching? We have not mentioned on the show yet. Ooh, uh, I think we mentioned, mentioned a lot of people. Bit. Yeah, I know we mentioned a lot of people. So I, I'm sorry if I'm going to have to repeat something, but uh, you know, I'm, this is going to be tough. I want to say, come back to me, but um, you know, I'm just going to say TJ Brody. I mean, yeah. I, I we, we didn't talk about him quite a bit. So I'm going to pick Brody, how he was able to like, you know, break up two on ones and be a great factor defensively. Obviously again, some miscues last season, but for the most part, he was very effective defensively. Um, I don't know. Kind of seems like an easy answer, but keep on watching TJ Brody because he's fantastic defensively. For sure. I'm still waiting for them to pair him with uh, Giordano because they were really good pairing oh, yeah. back when. So Kevin, what do you think uh, player we have not mentioned yet? We've mentioned him, but not too much. Uh, Pierre Engvall. Um, mm-hmm. If you watch this guy play, um, he really gets the attention of the opposition. You know, it doesn't get mentioned as much as uh, Michael Bunting, but guys get, he gets under guy's skin. And Keith has loved this guy forever. He was drafted by the Maple Leafs. They want him to finally use this big physical presence that he has, and they're giving him the opportunity. They've signed him the extension. Here's your chance. Prove it. And I think he uh, he's a guy to watch. And just watch him after the whistle every once in a while. It's kind of humorous. <laughs> yeah, Engvall's a bit of a character, so uh, it'll be fun to watch him. All right, Peter, uh, who will – this is gonna maybe an easy one, but who will lead the team in scoring on forward? Matthews there you go Kevin <laughs> I'm gonna go with uh no I'll go with Matthews <laughs> <laughs> easy one all right what about defense uh, Peter I mean this is maybe an obvious one too yeah Morgan Riley unless you know they get another top tier defender through a trade but Morgan Riley same Kevin uh, Morgan Riley. Same. yeah all right I say some teams have easier ones on this one so <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a big one. Um, Peter, what, one player that can be traded before the deadline? Uh, going to say Rasmus Sandin. I mean, that contract situation is going to be tough. Um, if they, it, I, I assume Dubas wants to no, avoid another William Nylander situation. If he can't get a deal done, try to move on out and get an asset in return, be it a player, prospect, pick, you name it. Yeah, all right. Uh, Kevin, what do you think uh, trade bait? Yeah, Sandine is there for sure, um, you know, and then there's seven UFAs coming up on this team. Um, but the yeah. issue is that this team's been built around, like, to have these players. And we know that these players, a lot of them were brought in as kind of prove them, and they're not going to be re-signed. These are their chance to get a deal um, and show that they belong in the NHL. So, um, yeah, I can only really see Sandine. And other than that, it's, it's going to be a draft pick that they would be trading away because they're not going to be trading away a player of – worth that's on the ice um at this point I, I can't see it all right bonus question who do you see them acquiring uh too early to tell, too early to tell. Uh, <laughs> i've got to say this because it might just be you know a video game dream but uh <laughs> i think there's issues in winnipeg and they're you know they've stripped the sea and they've got a great goalie there Mm. Uh, I would love to see an all in to get Connor Hellebuck in Toronto Mm. because, uh, I, the goaltending, I am just fearful of and Hellebuck is a a hell of a goalie. Right. So (laughs) and Winnipeg had some problems last year. I don't know if those problems are figured out, but, uh, they might be in rebuild mode and they could get a lot of good stuff for a guy like that. Oh Yeah. I would like to change my answer. And Matt, <laughs> you're probably not going to like this or either the Arizona Coyotes fans from the past, Connor Garland. That's been there your you guy for years. <laughs> it has yeah. been for years. And I'm so going to, I'm so going to stand by it. Did you get a Jersey I'm... made with that guy's name on it? And you're just waiting <laughs> to wear it or what? If the Maple Leafs do acquire him, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, for my part, I don't want him uh, out of Vancouver. I really yeah. do. So. <laughs> but he has been talked about that's for sure because the Canucks need defense so all right fun one here I know Kevin you alluded to you didn't want to say but bold prediction hot take for the season well the bold prediction is that I think Austin Matthews um he he will get the three-peat of the Rocket Richard 
Um, that might not be overly bold, but I think he could also uh, double up on the the Ted and uh, and the heart as well. I think he's uh, he's just become, you know, there's always the argument of Connor McDavid or Austin Matthews, and I, I really do feel that Austin Matthews has pulled into the lead on that for all around. Connor McDavid is an amazing player, but um, I just I I think Austin. I don't think we've seen the best of him yet, and I think we're going to see some incredible. Um, numbers i'm gonna say 70 goals this year oh, bold we prediction <laughs> we'll come back to that see if that happens <laughs> all right uh, peter a bold prediction or a hot cake uh john tavares gets 80 points i know that a lot of maple Leaf fans are not going to be happy with that because of the fact that he's a captain earning 11 million he's not scoring a lot yeah well you know he was almost under a point per game and he was four points away from cracking 80 points last season so at his age, the fact that he's healthy, the fact that he's got, you know, more training under his, uh, under his skin this time um, after that serious concussion that he suffered in the bubble, I think, you know, he, he, he seems more motivated this time around. I think he's going to have a really great season and 80 points is definitely within reach for him. Despite the fact that he is, you know, 32, I think he's still got a few more years at that age. And also Murray and Samsonov are going to be just fine. Yeah, that that's a pretty bold. <laughs> All right, now this is the ultimate question. Not so, so far as being making the playoffs, because they probably will. I, uh, Peter, where do you see them finishing in the standings? And I, I asked this: Will they make the playoffs? But I'm pretty sure they will. Mm-hmm. How far do they go in the playoffs? Yeah. Um. Again, I like to think that they can at least win a round in the playoffs, but overall in the standings, I think they may still finish second in the Atlantic. I'm obviously Florida still has the forward talent. They got Matthew Kachuk, but losing Mackenzie Weger is huge and their depth is not that great defensively. And if you have to rely on Sergei Bobrovsky and Spencer Knight, who I still love and I think is going to bounce back, but he just hasn't quite found his game just yet. To rely on that kind of goaltending that may, that I think is probably in a more questionable state than the Maple Leafs at this point, I think they vault over Florida because of that situation with their defense. And I, obviously I think Tampa is going to win it, but I think Toronto is going to be in that, you know, second, I'm going to throw in the third spot as well because anything can happen. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Kevin, what do you think of where they're going to finish? Well, I think they will. I think they will finish first in the Atlantic. Uh, the issue is they'll be against Florida or Tampa. I think mm-hmm. Tampa is going to be slow starters. Um, all these deep playoff runs that they've yeah. been going through yeah. have got to be st- starting to take a toll. They already have. Um, so I don't think Tampa is going to be as good during the regular season and they'll uh, turn it on in the playoffs. And so I think there's a real good opportunity for this team to grab the Atlantic title. All right. How far do you see them going in the playoffs? And that's where I come to an all stop. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, I don't know. I'm very hopeful that the bottom six has got enough to provide that depth and grit that this team needs on the forward lines. But it's still that the defense and the goalies are just Mm -hmm. too big of a question mark for me. I can't. I, you guys know every year I get asked yeah. if I'm taking the Leafs. And of course I bet every year the Leafs are going to win the cup because that's what I have to do. But mm-hmm. um, I can't, I can't make those bets anymore without knowing I'm just giving a charity at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Can I do a go. third bold take and say that they will reach the Eastern conference final? All right. You're throwing I, I, them all in there. Again, again, really bold take. I think it's going to be bolder <laughs> than my other two, but at the same time, I think they figure things out. I really do. All right. Like I say this is this is gonna come back as a clip. Uh, I'll, I'll run this clip right after. <laughs> hey, I'll eat my words if I have to. I'll I'll, I'll do it. But hey, um, you got to be optimistic. You got to have faith, right? Um, no, that's true. That's true. All right. Well, I thanks Peter. Thanks Kevin for coming on the season preview show. I you know we went through a lot and uh, hopeful that. Uh, the season will be good. And well, obviously there's going to be a lot of ups and downs as it always is uh, throughout the regular season on any of these teams we cover. So uh, it's going to be fun. But before I let you guys go, uh, we like to do a segment on the Hockey Writers Podcast, an article of the day. So they give you an opportunity to either plug your own stuff or someone on the Maple Leafs writing team. And um, so it's let you kind of feature an article. So Peter, I'll go first with you. 
Um, I'm going to say Rangers Drury gets a nice return in Nils Lundqvist trade by Brian Abate. Um, obviously, it was difficult to try and trade a young, promising 2A defender for the Rangers, but given their situation and how they're really stable on the back end, um, to get a first round, a conditional first round pick in 2023, but could go to 2024. Um, the fact that if even if the, that pick is outside the top 10 and the Rangers keep it, they're getting a heck of a prospect. And I know go to uh, Prospects Corner for, um, you know, talk about 2023 draft stuff because it's going to be great. But the fact that they were able to get that kind of pick in return for a defender that's still struggling to maintain status inside and out of the lineup was a really great get and i think that you know this proves that the rangers are starting to make some key moves that are still building to be that contender but also still looking to maintain their prospect depth as well so um i thought it was a really great read by brian um get, uh, uh, that's my article of the day all right you went outside the maple leafs but uh yeah. we're usually <laughs> keeping it in the team but yeah that's fine I uh, <laughs> all right kevin now uh, what do you have we've got enough talk there? really there's a lot. Maple Leafs side kind of dominate. Oh, I, 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 okay. That was that was my mistake. Um, I, no I problem. Wrote with a different I'm article sure because... Brian appreciates it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kevin. I'm going to go. Got? My article is uh, is actually by my man Peter here because every writer on the Maple Leafs has kind of talked about the same thing, and his is Maple Leafs must be willing to go all in for a Stanley Cup, and pretty much everybody has kind of said that one way or another. So I always like reading what his reasons are and kind of where he sees things going with that. Um, Cause I've, I've unfortunately mentioned the whole cliche. It's become the cliche of the last dance, but it really is like, this really is. And it's kind of exciting to think uh, from a writing perspective that if this doesn't go as planned, big changes are coming. Yeah. Um, if it does go to plan, it's still exciting to cover that too. So we want to see uh, see this this all in that uh, all the writers have talked about, and uh, I really like Peter's article that has the same talk and his ideas about how it's going to be all in. There you go. All right. Well, Dubis had like you say, Dubis in his last contract, you know, finally of his contract. I'm sure if they if they get kicked in the first round, I don't think he's back. So. Uh, we will have to see how that all plays out <laughs> because I totally messed up uh, the article today because I thought I was still, you know, picking other people's articles. I'm sorry about that, but I, I if we're doing leaf content, I want to do Alex Hobson's four takeaways from day one of Maple Leafs training camp. I'm sorry if I'm doing two, but now that I realize it is for the Maple Leafs team, um, he did a great <laughs> recap of everything that unfolded uh, for the Maple Leafs uh, from Dubas's comments to uh, the Rodion and Amirov's um, possible return to the season based on his, you know, uh, cancer treatment and going through his last uh, chemotherapy. I thought he covered everything in like spot on with every single aspect in major detail. So um, give uh, that a read as well for takeaways in terms of lease content for takeaways from day one by Alex. Awesome. There you go. So Brian, you got an extra bonus on, on a show. That <laughs> that, there you go. Read that as well. Um, yeah. I know Lundquist was in the discussion that Maple Leafs mm -hmm. could, could have been in there too. So there was connections. All right. Um, but thanks uh, again for Peter, uh, Peter and Kevin coming on the show. Uh, it was great talking Maple Leafs and uh, what's going to happen this season. Uh, we're almost, I think we're over halfway of all the teams we're doing previews for. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to start packaging these together because we're, we're coming up on the big, you know, the season kind of starting here. So uh, preseason just around the corner. We're recording this preseason game start tomorrow, uh, which would be Saturday. I, you know, and hockey's back. We're going to start watching some, some stuff, even though it's preseason, everyone loves it. Uh, it's hockey on TV. So uh, that's, and not online streaming like the rookie camps, which <laughs> are hit or miss for those, oh, those online streams, but uh, it was fun to watch. We'll get some actual games on TV that are on through networks. So I will have some fun watching hockey and, but uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, joining us on another hockey writers podcast season preview show. Uh, make sure you're checking out all the Maple Leafs writers uh, content throughout uh, the preseason going to the regular season. They've got a lot of preview posts already out there kind of preparing everyone for the regular season. And uh, so there's lots of stuff to read. If you're a Maple Leafs fan, hockey fan in general, there's lots of stuff to read on the website as well. So take a look, take a look at that. Take a look at the morning skate newsletter, morningskate.io. 
And that's going Monday, Wednesday, and Friday until it goes back to its regular schedule of Monday to Friday once the regular season starts. And uh, check out our quick fire with the hockey writers, which we've got a few episodes out as well on the YouTube channel that uh, we'll have a few more as the season goes. But uh, check those out. And um, we'll see you next time on another season preview show on the Hockey Writers Podcast. <laughs>